This is the second hour of Physics 1C for November 29th. I wanted to mention one other thing. In the last uh, hour, we talked about and developed this idea of inductive reactants. And I mentioned that when omega is big, XL is big. When omega is small, XL is small. So one thing that you can use this to do in a, uh, in a circuit is that you can use an inductor to allow these smaller frequency signals to come through and to block out the high frequency signals. Okay, so uh, an inductor can be used as what's called a, uh, um, maybe some of you have heard this before if you work in electronic with electronic devices, it can be referred to as a low pass filter. And the idea is that if a circuit has a lot of inductance or a lot of inductive reactance, then it's going to kind of amplify the signals that have low frequencies or DC signals. And it's gonna to tend to kind of suppress or block the signals that have high frequencies. So it lets the low frequencies through. Okay, that's what that low pills pass filter means. Yeah, I figured Justin, you might've dealt with these before. So, so what was I trying to say? Low pass filter means that, um, I don't want to write it all down, but basically what I just said is that um, DC and low frequency signals are going to come through just fine, but the higher frequency signals are going to be more blocked. What I think of when I think of this is an equalizer. I don't, I don't know how, if any of you have dealt with like sound systems that have equalizers in them, but I don't know, probably your car has one. And... Uh, you know, maybe some of you have seen these kind of things before. Let me show you a picture of what an equalizer looks like. And you tell me if you've seen these before. You've probably seen them. You've probably seen these kind of things in. Um, let's do that so it gets rid of the Denzel movie. Yeah, they look like this, or like this. I guess is a pretty good example of it. Model 2 Sega Genesis has one, but Model 1's is weak, and some people buy Model 2's for that reason. It's on the Yamaha sound chip. Okay, so when I think of equalizer, this is the kind of thing I think of, right? So you've got, at the top here, these are frequencies. Okay, so 16 kilohertz, 8 kilohertz, 4 kilohertz, 1,000 kilohertz, or 1 kilohertz, and then 500, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all the low frequencies down here. And the way that these devices work, you have volume and gain, but the things in the middle the levels, so to speak, um, allow you to, by, by turning these up here on the left, the ones that are over here, by increasing these, you make the sound sound have more bass to it. And by increasing the ones over here on the right, you get more of the kind of like the voices, like soprano voices and stuff come out. Have you all seen these kind of things before? Whether you've seen them in a physical box or you've played with um, a sound editing device. Sound editing devices are always going to have stuff on these, like a, on a computer too. It's exactly the same concept. So when I say that it's a low pass filter, right, that means that a circuit with a lot of inductance is going to tend to let these frequencies through and it's going to block these frequencies, right? So effectively what you do by increasing these base signals, right, is somewhere within the circuit you are increasing the inductance. Does that make sense? Because by increasing the inductance, you suppress these signals and you amplify these signals, right? So by raising those knobs, you're making the total inductance of the circuit go up through something that's happening within the system. It could be that there's a coil and by manipulating these knobs, there's like a, um, a, uh, like a, an iron core that goes in and out. Uh, it could be there's something that increases the number of coils in your system, whatever it is. Um, yeah, have, so some of you have seen these before, some of you maybe haven't. We call it an equalizer. It's a way to modify the sound that's coming out of a sound system effectively. And at its core, what's really happening is by increasing those base signals, you're just increasing this quantity, which allows the low frequency signals to come through. And that's what we call the low pass filter. It allows the low signals through, it blocks the high signals. I find that really fascinating. That, like. 
the way we listen to music, the way that a DJ may change and manipulate the sounds that you hear at a concert or something like that, at its core has to do with just inductors inside of a circuit. There's more complicated stuff going on, but at the end of the day, that's the physics of it. It's pretty powerful. So you now kind of understand a little bit about sound engineering, at least the physics of sound engineering, based on this idea that if you that you can that you can manipulate the type of signal you're getting. And focus on bass signals if you want to have like a lot of like thumping bass, and focus on uh, the high signals if you want to focus on voices. Alrighty. So the next thing we want to do is talk about a capacitor in an AC circuit. So that's going to look like this. We're going to have our voltage source, V and T, connected up to just a capacitor with capacitance C. Now the interesting thing here is that when you have a DC signal, the, D, the a direct current circuit will just charge up the capacitor up to the point that the capacitor has the same charge as the voltage, and then the current will just stop flowing. But in an AC circuit, what's going to happen is that this plate's going to start off positive and this plate's going to be negative, but then the polarity is going to flip back and forth and back and forth. Okay, so the charge is a function of time on these capacitor plates is always going to be changing, okay? And you could even describe how there's still a current in the circuit now, I of T, and just like we did before, so we can ultimately compare these again to each other, we're gonna use the idea that I mag, that the current as a function of time is gonna be given by this expression, okay? And what we wanna figure out is how is the voltage across the capacitor gonna be related to this? So we hook this up to a voltmeter. We'll say that it's gonna be measuring VC, it's gonna be measuring RMS current, but we're gonna talk about the voltage is a function of time. Now, what we know in this case is that um, if we take, what is it? It's C times V, right? So if we take capacitance times the voltage, this should be equal to the charge as a function of time, right? Sorry, let me just, um, of T, there we go. And we also know that if we take the derivative of both sides of this, that what we'll get is C times the derivative with respect to time on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, if I take the time derivative of Q, then what I get is current. So the current as a function of time then should be equal to C times the derivative of the voltage but we can multiply the dt to both, hand, both sides. So we get on the left-hand side, c dvc is equal to i of t dt. And then we can integrate both sides from zero to t prime. Yeah, that, that's fine. And the left-hand side will just integrate from zero to vc. So we end up getting that c times Vc of t should be equal to this integral here, and that's going to be the integral from 0 to t prime. Oh, do we want to use 0? I guess it works fine if we use 0. Of i max times the cosine of omega t. We take the integral here. The integral of cosine will be sine, positive sine, times i max. And over omega, right? Because of the chain rule. See, if we take the derivative of this, derivative of sine is cosine times omega, so cancel out with that, looks good. We evaluate this from zero up to some t prime. Left hand side stays the same. Oh, I apologize, that went off the screen a little bit. We'll scroll down. And then we have that vc of t is going to be equal to I max times 1 divided by omega times C. So we divide the C over here. And then if I evaluate sine of omega t from t prime to 0, sine of 0 is 0. So this is just going to become the sine of omega times t prime. But we can just get rid of the prime because it's kind of just a dummy variable. 
And there we go. We have this relationship. That's going to be the voltage across our capacitor. And let's take that real quick, copy that, and come up here a little bit. So that's what we got for our voltage across our capacitor. That's our current across the capacitor. And so again, we're going to want to use a trig identity. And in this case, the identity is going to be that sine of omega t is equal to, what is it, cosine. The other one was plus. This one has to be minus. Cosine omega t minus pi over 2. And we could just check to see if this is true again because it's a cosine one and they're easy to do. So this would be cosine of omega t, you do cos cos, times the cosine of pi over 2. That's 0. And then it's plus, when this is negative, this is plus, sine of omega t, and then sine of pi over 2. And it works out because that's 0 and that's 1. So we get that uh, sine omega t. Well, it proves what we're trying to prove. This is equal to that. OK, so given that that's the case, our voltage function, we can now write Vc of t as being I max times 1 over omega c multiplied by s cosine of omega t minus pi over 2. OK, so now if we plot a phasor diagram for these ones, and use the same kind of colors that we did before. We were using green for the current. The current is going to be the same as it was before. So this is going to be our IMAX phaser. And it's oscillating around at omega. And now VC should be pi over 2 behind this one. So we go and we draw VC in here with red. I have to tell you, I'm feeling very sick getting kind of worried because I felt great when I woke up this morning and then I went out for the day and now I feel sick I'm getting very worried that I may have picked up something um, which would be really bad so hopefully I feel better by the time we have a lab on Wednesday um, so this is going to be V max I'm starting to worry I have to give a test time I'm worried I shouldn't even go in regardless uh, so this is uh, this is 90 degrees here. Right? So now the angle that's made by V max is going to be omega t minus pi over 2, right? Like this angle down here. Do I need to write it? I guess I can. But this angle here is omega t minus pi over 2. So if omega times t was like 30, then this would be 60, right? Or, well, negative 60, right? Okay, so then what we take away from this is that the voltage phasor or the voltage across the capacitor, we're going to say that this one lags the current by pi over 2. Okay, So the, the inductor circuit led by pi over 2, the capacitor circuit lags by pi over 2. And we can go a little bit farther. We can acknowledge that in this circuit, if we look at this piece right here, I guess I could write this over here, that V max is equal to I max times 1 over omega c. But we could define this thing here. So we're going to say let x sub c, this is another type of reactance, is going to be 1 over omega times c. We call this one, I think, I think calling both of them just reactants is fine. Oops. Capacitive reactants. Reactants. NCE. There we go. Capacitive reactants. And this allows us to turn our inductor, sorry, our capacitor into kind of like a resistor, okay? The units for this are also going to be ohms. You can check it for yourself. The 1 over omega c has the units of ohms. And yeah, now what we can say is that the current that comes through our circuit now, I max, 
is going to be related to the voltage that we apply divided by XC. Just like with, uh, you know, current is V over R or current is V over XL, we now have current is equal to V over XC. What this allows us to do is to tell us how a capacitor can affect the output current that you get in the circuit. Now, in this case, th things are a little bit reversed from what they were for the, for the inductor, because now when omega is big, x sub c is small, right? And when omega is small, because it's in the denominator, xc is going to be big. And that is why you can use a capacitor as a high-pass filter. So a capacitor can be used to make what's called a high-pass filter, allowing the high frequencies through and suppressing the low frequencies. So I think with the, the inductor, it's really obvious why it is that when omega is big, XL is big. I think this is not as obvious. Can any of you come up with a reason why this would be true? What this is basically saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. To go back to the equalizer, if it's a high pass filter, by increasing these quantity, these knobs on the right, where you're trying to bump up the high frequency sounds that are coming out of your system, that means that you are increasing the capacitive reactants by adding additional capacitors. And we're going to see uh, some effect of that in some of the later. Uh, I, th I find it really fascinating, too, that you know we, we learned early in the semester about these things called capacitors, but what we learned is they're kind of just these two plates that you know one charges here and one charges here, and there's a separation. And now we've gotten a little bit farther into this, and we found that when you hook up a capacitor to an AC circuit, all of a sudden it behaves kind of a lot more like a resistor in a weird way. Except instead of just resisting current, it resists high frequency current. And no, 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 sorry, this one resists low frequency current, right? Yeah, this one's the one that resists low frequency current. So why do you all think that's the case? With the inductor, I think it's obvious that high frequency means the inductor does more, right? But why is this the case that when omega is small, the capacitive reactance gets large? Why, why would the frequency of the current in the circuit, right? The frequency, again, just to remind you, is how fast the electrons are moving back and forth, right? That's the frequency. Why would, why would a capacitor care about the frequency? What does a capacitor care about frequency? Isn't it just this thing that holds charges? What do you all think? Why does the capacitor care about the frequency? I mean, capacitors obviously don't have feelings, but... Why does the capacitor have more of an impact on the circuit when the angular frequency is small than it does when the angular frequency is big? Does it affect how much charge can build up? That seems reasonable. If the frequency is small, then there's more time that the current is on. So what does low frequency mean? Low frequency means that the current flows in one direction for a long period of time and then eventually turns around and goes in the other direction, and then it turns around and goes back in the other direction, but it's doing it over long time scales, right? When omega is small, the current goes this way and then this way, and it goes really fast, right? So imagine that you're a capacitor plate right here, right? And the current spends a long time flowing in this direction. That means that this capacitor plate is gonna start to charge up. And as the capacitor plate starts to charge up, it's going to exert a EMF in the other direction. It's going to exert a force in the other direction, right? Because the more the more that the capacitor charges up, the more influence it's going to have on the attempt to put more charges on it, right? So when omega is small, that means there's more time for the capacitor to charge up, which means there's more time for the capacitor to start to slow down the current. When the frequency is fast, then the capacitor doesn't get any chance to charge up before the current starts flowing out of it again, right? And so as, that's, that's kind of the reason why. It does affect how much charge can build up because the charge doesn't build up instantly, it takes time. Okay, so we have our capacitive reactants, we've got our inductive reactants, 
we have all of our different phasor diagrams. I think we can just throw everything together now. Basically what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna put all of these onto one diagram and talk about some of the effects of that, okay? So we're gonna talk about the LRC series circuits. So what is this one gonna look like? For this one, what we're gonna have is voltage source. Capacitor, resistor, inductor, and now what we know is we can we can basically construct. Uh, it, it again, we'll we'll say the current. Just to keep things simple, we have to fix something, and the thing we're going to fix in this case is going to be the current. All right, now let's use this technology of phasors to come up with an answer for what what the, the relationship is gonna be between the voltage and the current here, okay? All right, do I need to write down all the things that we said before? Here, let's, 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 let's write down all the, let's summarize the things that we've said before. So what we have uh, for the resistor was that uh, V was equal to IR and that it was in phase. For the inductor, we had that VL was equal to I times XL. And we said that the, um, the voltage VL um, leads the current by pi over two. And then for the capacitor, we had that VC was um, I times XC. These C's and L's look a lot like each other, so I apologize for that. In this one, VC lags the current by pi over two. So let's throw all those things together on our picture right here. So for the current phasor, I think we were always using green, so we'll keep doing that. So here's our current phasor. Oops, with length I max, right? And on top of that, I'm gonna draw my phaser for the resistor voltage right here. So this is gonna be, we're gonna call that VR. We have to kind of change, we can't just call everything Vmax anymore. Um, but we know that here, this is VR, IR. Now, I want to draw a phaser for VL. We know VL is going to lead I by pi over 2. So my VL phasor is going to have to be coming up like this. We need to be ahead by pi over 2. I'm going to make this one kind of longer. So that's my VL phasor. We know that that's the 90 degrees right there. And then... For VC, VC needs to be behind by pi over two. Uh, just to remind everyone that this is the omega T right here. And then we'll draw in a phaser for this one. That's gonna be VC. Like that. Okay, now the thing about these is that because VR, VL and VC are all at kind of right angles to each other, the way that we want to add these up is we want to vector add them, okay? And what we're ultimately going to get is the voltage across our source. In fact, what I could do here is, I could, on my picture here, I could be a little more clear about what it is that we're doing. So imagine that we put around each of these, we throw ourselves, here, let me make, I'll, I'll draw this part first. So this is going to measure VR, this is gonna measure VL, we put voltmeters into our system. This is gonna measure VC. And finally, we're also gonna put one up here. It's not gonna have much room here. And this is gonna measure the voltage across the source. Yes, right here, okay? So these ones are measuring the voltage across the resistor, the voltage across the inductor, and the voltage across the capacitor. 
And ultimately, we want to figure out what's the voltage across the source. And one thing that I can ask right now is, what do you think? Is Vs going to be equal to the sum of Vc plus Vr plus Vl? Is this true? In a DC circuit, this is definitely true, right? If I measure the voltage across, across this, this, and this, the sum of them should be equal to the voltage drop across the source. But in this case, this isn't true anymore. This is not going to work. And can you see why? The reason why is because they're vectors, basically, right? They're vectors that are out of phase with one another, and the voltage across each of these is like a cosine function, right? Each of which is slightly out of phase with one another. I'll just remind you what those voltages looked like before. So here, this was Vc, right? Omega t minus pi over 2. And if we go back to Vl, we have cosine of omega t plus pi over 2. And if we go back to Vr, which is basically, well, it's like that equation right there. You can't just add this cosine omega t plus cosine omega t plus pi over 2 and cosine omega t minus pi over 2 and expect it all to work out because they're, they don't have their maximum values at the exact same time. And that's why we have to add them together in this picture. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to say take this vector here and because it is pointing in the same direction as VL, or it should be, I thought they were, because it's pointing in the same direction as VL, if I place it on top of here, then the shortened vector that I get out of that, and I'll draw it with a different color here, let's use this color, is going to be VL minus VC. So this vector here, we're going to say is VL minus VC. Now I can only do that because, well, this is the only reason I can do that. Suppose that there's a road, right? And I tell you to walk four meters in this direction and then walk two meters back in this direction, right? I could ask, how far are you away from the starting point? Well, you know the answer is just four minus two, right? That's easy, right? Um, but if instead I ask you the question, here's a road and you walk four meters this way and then you walk two meters straight down, so this is four and this is two, and I ask you now, what's the length from your starting position well, now you know that you need to do vectors, right? You need to say, I need to do 4 squared minus 2 squared to get this over here, right? So what is that? 16 minus 4 is the square root of uh, 12, right? Um, this is just for simple vector reasons. I know that I can take these two numbers here, VL and VC, and because they're in a straight line, I can just subtract them to create a new vector or phase or that I call VL minus VC. All right, now what you can do is say, to find the voltage across my source, it should be the sum of this voltage phasor plus this voltage phasor. But of course, the way that we go about adding those is gonna be using the Pythagorean theorem. So on here, I'm gonna draw a new vector. We'll use purple to represent the source voltage. Whoops. Here, go away. There we go. Shapes, this one. My source voltage is gonna be the triangle that completes this right here. Actually, a better way to do it would probably be to copy paste this and put it right here at the end. And then I can connect these like this right there. There we go. And then this is still VL minus VC. And now this purple vector that we've constructed here, we're gonna call VS or the voltage across the source. This is really the voltage across all the elements basically. Okay. I'm going to define this angle right here to be phi. It's going to be what we call the phase angle. And this is going to be the angle between the phase difference between the voltage here, or the current phasor, and the voltage across the source. Right? Because my current phasor doesn't have a phase angle in it. But what's going to happen is that my solution here is going to be that Vs of t, okay, is going to be equal to Vmax, we'll talk about what that's equal to, multiplied by the cosine of omega t plus phi. Because if you remember how these things worked, what I said was at any moment in time, if you find a projection down here onto this axis, you can find the instantaneous value that you might measure. So if we take that same idea to Vs. If I drop a line down here, then this side over here is going to be Vs of t, right? And to figure out 
you know what that is, we're going to need this phase angle right here. And can you see that if that's V, maybe I should leave it on here. I don't know. I don't know if it's as useful seeing this on here. If I tell you that this is Vs of t, well, you can see the angle, right? It's omega t plus phi. And that's why it shows up right here. Okay, so we would like to find out what the angle is. And we would like to know what the relationship is between V max and I max. There's a very simple relationship, as it turns out, using something that we're going to call impedance. Okay, um, I could leave those lines on there, right? Hopefully you all can still see what's going on. Um, we've got this right triangle right here that we're, gonna, we're now gonna look at. Okay, so what do we know? When I look at that right triangle right there, I notice that I have a leg that's VR, right? This is basically my triangle. I have a leg here that's VR. I have a height that's VL minus VC. And I have a length over here that's Vs, the voltage of the torsion, and this angle is phi, right? So when I look at that, and I know that that's a right triangle, I can say that Vs squared should be equal to Vr squared plus from the Pythagorean theorem, right? But when I look at the right-hand side of this equation, we, we might you might remember that V sub R was equal to I times R. Oh, well, you can, you can see it all right here. That V times L, I'm oh, sorry, VL, was equal to I times XL, the inductive reactants. And VC was I times XC. Right? And I, I guess I can... Now, let's not square root. I think it makes it look bad when I start drawing radicals over these long expressions with capitals. So Vs squared is equal to I squared, every term has an I in it, right? Multiplied by R squared plus XL minus XC squared, right? And now I think it's relevant to go ahead and square root both sides. So we'll have a square root over all this stuff. All right. And now what we have is Vs is equal to I multiplied by the square root of R squared plus... It doesn't actually matter the order in which you subtract these because it's squared. So if for some reason you forget, the order just doesn't matter. It's just the difference between the two of them and you square it. And what we're going to do is we're going to define z equal to the square root of r squared plus xl minus xc squared. And then we have this really nice simple result, which is the voltage of our source is going to be equal to i times z. And z is called impedance. I don't know how you all pronounce it. I pronounce it impedance. It could be pronounced impotence, but then it starts to get uh, kind of starts to sound like a word that means something completely different. So I, that's why I say impedance, just to to indicate. And this is kind of like I, I don't know. I don't know what an electrical engineer would call this, but to me, this is kind of like generalized resistance in a way. I don't know if that's a good way of putting it. Maybe somewhere down the line, one of your much more intelligent uh, engineering teachers can tell you a better way to think about this. But I think about it as generalized resistance because if you, if you look at the way this equation works, right, this tells us that the current in the system, and I'm not writing them here, but these are technically maximums, so let me write it over here correctly. I max is equal to Vs max divided by Z, right? You can compare this to I equal to V over R. They look almost exactly the same. Impedance has units of resistance as well. So the units of this are ohms. The units of XL, XC, and R are all ohms. So impedance is that. Okay, so now that we've got that, that's a nice uh, simple result. Um, these, these things work for RMS current too, by the way. So the same relationship here, VS RMS, is also going to be IRMS times Z because IRMS is just this over root 2. VRMS is this over root 2, so the root 2s basically just cancel out. So also write it like this, but keep in mind that z is equal to that. 
Okay, new equations. And, oh, we also wanted to find the phase angle, right? Well, that's easy to do. There's two different ways that we can do that. If we look at our triangle right here, we can say that the cosine of phi in this triangle would be VR over VS, which would be equal to VR is IR and VS is IZ now, right? So cosine of phi is just R over Z. That's one way we can write it down. We're gonna call this thing the power factor pretty soon. So just keep that, this cosine phi thing is gonna show up again. Um, finally, we can also write the tangent of phi. You all tell me, is this off screen or do I need to move it? The tangent of phi should be opposite over adjacent. VL minus VC divided by VR. I'll just scroll down just a little bit, just in case. And VL is I times XL minus VC, which is I times XC divided by VR, which is I times R. So tan phi is going to just be XL minus XC divided by R. You can see from this equation here that phi is going to be greater than zero uh, if and only if um, XL minus XC is greater than zero, which is to say XL has to be greater than XC. So if phi is positive, we say that the circuit has more inductance than it has uh, capacitance in terms of the reactances. And if it's negative, then, um, you know, XC is minus XL. The other thing is uh, in the picture here, I specifically made it so that VL was bigger than VC. V VL actually goes, it's, I can't click on it anymore, but VL is this whole length right here, right? So I made VL bigger than VC. So my phi came out as a positive number. But if VC had been bigger, right? Then this vector here, like if VC was bigger than VL, my vector would be pointing down like this. And I hope you can see that that would imply that you have a negative phase angle, okay? What does the phase angle do? Well, just to summarize where it all came from, the phase angle tells us what we put into this equation. Uh, what was it? Cosine of omega t plus phi. That's where the phase angle shows up in that. And the interesting thing that can happen in these type of circuits is when the phase angle is non-zero, what we're going to find is the circuit is actually less efficient than it would be if the phase angle is zero. Less efficient at converting input power to output work, basically. All right, did I leave off any of these equations? Okay, we got Z. Yeah, that's everything, right? I think we can start doing problems. And do we have enough time? Sure, we can do at least one. We're getting through this chapter real fast. I think this chapter is pretty easy. I don't know what you all think, but... Um, yeah, just this one, I guess. Wait, oh, there we go, there's two. I thought there were two. Okay. These are really the same problem. I don't know why they're split up like this. It's weird because uh, I was doing a problem by 1B class this week, or last week, I guess, and it had like 30 different answers. You know, there are like four parts, but each part had like 10 answers on it or something stupid. Um, and they had no qualms with putting that all, it was, it was this immense problem that had all these steps that took up like multiple screens. Um, sometimes they dump a bunch of stuff into one problem, and then sometimes they split up a problem that makes no sense to split up. I don't, I don't know what the book does sometimes, but anyway. LRC series circuit. It says in the series circuit of figure whatever, that's going to be my figure here, basically, this figure. And we're not going to copy, we'll just redraw it. Suppose that R is equal to 300, L is equal to 60, C is equal to 0.5, V is equal to 50, and omega is equal to 10,000 radians per second. We want to find the reactances XL, XC, the impedance Z, the current amplitude I, the phase angle, all this stuff. Sorry, I need to sneeze, but it's not happening. So we've got our circuit. We know the values of L, R, and C in this case. L is equal to 60 millihenries, so that's 0.06 henry. Capacitance is 0.5 microfarads, so 0.5 times 10 to the minus 6 farad. 
And resistance is 300 ohms. Voltage. So when they say V here, do they mean VRMS or do they mean Vmax? Who knows? I know. It's not very clear, but this is Vmax. And then we're also given Omega is 10,000. Sometimes they're going to give you the frequency in F frequency, and you're just going to have to convert to Omega by multiplying by 2 pi. So we need to find XL, XC, Z, I, phase angle, voltage amplitude across each term. So a bunch of different things. Okay, so first thing it wants us to do is to find XL. XL is equal to Omega times L. So we take Omega, multiply by the inductance, which is 0.06. You're going to find that these problems, these, uh, these AC circuit problems, they're pretty easy. Mostly just a lot of plug and chugging. Okay, you'd, you'd think that AC circuits would be more complicated than DC circuits, but they're just not. They're just, they're a lot easier. And the reason why they're easier is because of these generalized uh, reactances that we can calculate. So 10,000 times 0.06, so that's like 100 times 6, I think this is 600. You'll have to check and make sure I'm not wrong. XC, second thing we want to find here, is 1 over omega times C. So that's going to be 1 divided by 10,000 multiplied by C. All right, so what we got here? So this is 1E4 times 1E negative 6. So that's 1E negative 2 times 5E negative 1 will be, hold on a second. I think we're going to get 500. No. Maybe we're going to get 200. 200? I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. 200. And that's what x sub c is. Right, because it's 0.5 times 10 to the negative 2, and 0.5 is 1 over 2, so it's 2 times 10. Yeah, okay. 200. And then the impedance Z. Well, the impedance is just R squared plus XL minus XC squared. So this one is the square root of R was 300 plus XL was 600. XC is 200. Just put the unit on the outside, and we get that z is equal to 300 squared plus 400 squared is 2,500. And we take the square root of that, not 2,500, it's going to be like 250,000 or something, but the square root of that is going to be uh, 500 ohms. Okay, pretty easy. Um, the current amplitude I, for that one we can say that I max should be equal to V max divided by Z, the impedance. So V max is 50. If we divide by 500 ohms, we're going to get uh, 0 0.1 amps. That's I max. Oops. 0.1 amps. What's next? Um, the current amplitude I, the phase angle phi. Mm, let's start a new thing over here. To find the phase angle I, sorry, phi, we can do the arc cosine of R over Z. So we go back up just a little bit here. Cosine phi is equal to R over Z, so inverse cosine of R over Z should give you the, the angle phi. 
So this is going to be the arc cosine of r, which is 300, over z, which was 500. And in degrees, the arc cosine of 3 over 5 is going to be like 53 degrees, I think, because 3, 4, 5 triangle. Of course, we could put that into radians as well. Finally, they want us to find the voltage amplitude across each circuit element. For that, all we have to do is to find what VR, VL, etc. are. So just starting with VR, VR is going to be equal to the maximum current times the resistance. So in this case, that's equal to 0 0.1 amps times our resistance, which was 300 ohms. So now VR is equal to 30, 30 volts. We'll do the other ones as well. So VL is going to be equal to I max times XL. Skipping plugging the numbers in here because I think you can see what XL is this and I think we're going to get 60 volts. And finally VC is going to be I max times X sub C. Scroll down just a little bit. X sub C was 200. So V sub C is going to be 20 volts. And you can see that it's kind of interesting that even though the voltage of the source, the maximum, is only 50 volts, the voltage across the inductor is actually larger than that. And you can also see that the total voltage across each of these summed does not give you 50, right? If you do 60 plus 30 plus 20, what do you get? 90, 110, right? But if you do 30 plus 60 minus 20, that still doesn't work. Uh, which kind of just goes to show that you can't just add these things up to get that. Okay. Any questions? All right. Yeah, I don't know why they separate this into a second problem, but... The second half of this says, for the LRC circuit of the same example that we just did, find expressions for the time dependence of the instantaneous current I and the instantaneous voltages across the resistor VR, inductor VL, capacitor VC, and AC source V. Okay, this is quite easy to do. Um, to find the voltage across the resistor as a function of time, right? That's what they want you to do, right? Is the time dependence, right? All we have to do is to take our current as a function of time and measure by the resistance, R. So this one is just going to be I max multiplied by R multiplied by the cosine of omega t. Because just to remind you, I of t was cosine of, oops, I of t in the circuit was I max times the cosine of omega t. Really, actually, I guess what they want us to do, I, really what I should be doing here, I should really just put VR right here, which we know is 30 volts, right? That's probably an easier way to write it, just th so that it's clear c compared to what we had just done. Um, so this is going to just be VR. So the instantaneous voltage across the resistor is going to be VR, which was 30 volts, cosine of omega, which was 10,000, Remember that the voltage across the inductor, or the resistor, is in phase with the current, okay? The voltage across the inductor, as a function of time, should be equal to VL cosine of omega t. This is where it's useful to remember, what does the inductance do? Does it lead or lag? And I believe that the inductor was the one that leads the current by pi over 2, right? So this one's going to be 
see, VL is 60 times the cosine of omega t plus phi, so omega is 10,000. And then we just need to add to that pi over 2 radians. Yeah, we should, we should write this in radians, right? Because if that's radians per second, we need to put this in radians. So this is VL of t. To get VC, we're going to have VC cos of, this is the one that lags by pi over 2. Um, VC was 220 volts cosine of oops, pi over 2 equals, this is VC. And then we have the voltage of the source. This is the one that's just going to be Vs multiplied by um, cosine of omega t plus the phase angle phi. I think we are going to have to convert our phase angle. So 53 degrees, if you take 53.1 degrees and we multiply by pi over 180, this will give us our phase angle in radians. Eight. Here, you know what I want to do actually? In radians, I'm just going to find. Ah, this is fine. We'll just put 0 0.93. That's fine. 0 0.93 radians. So for this, I think Vs, which would be I times Z, is 50. Yeah, 50 volts. So 50 volts cosine of 10,000 radians per second times time, I'm just noticing in here that I left off the time, um, and then here this is plus our phase angle, 0 0.93 radians. And that is going to be the voltage across the source, and that is all they wanted us to find, I think. Resistor, inductor, capacitor, source. And then this is I. Any questions about that? Does that all make sense? Oh, I guess one thing I left out. Did I leave it out? Did I say that uh, you can also use IRMS for these equations? Yeah, I did. Okay, never mind. I didn't leave it out. Okay, so there we go. Time to take another break. Um, the last hour of class may be a little shorter than normal. Anyway, break until it really is just plug and chug. Yeah, it's, this stuff is really easy. Hope you all don't have too many problems with it on your homework, but who knows, some of them might be a little kind of tricky. I, I will show you one way in which they can be a little more tricky um, once we talk about power factor and all that kind of stuff. So come uh, take a break. Wait, did I stop the...